Chapter Twenty Three of Spun from Fact by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three. I am to go. Jeanie's friend and co-laborer sat on the edge of a chair in that uncertain attitude which denotes a bewildered state of mind and at the same time a determination to move in some direction soon her face expressed perplexity the room was book-strewn as though many people might have been in and out in the course of the day overturning them and in point of fact this is what they had done looked at different bindings commented on the engraving which formed the frontispiece assured one another that it was a very neat volume and very cheap and certainly ought to sell well being a record of facts and then for the most part had gone on their way buying nothing Jeanie's face was serene as usual but thoughtful well her friend said at last breaking the perplexed silence what about ocean grove then the curious little laugh which was Jeanie's own rippled out it depends upon your faith can you venture on seventy-five cents it is all i have well but Jeanie barrett do you believe we are to go not if we have but seventy-five cents to go with that is equivalent to a direction to stay quietly at home until the means are provided to go honestly and yet if i ever saw a duty in my life i thought it was for you to go to that place so it may be there are several hours to train time i believe if we are to go the means will be forthcoming in time there are two hundred books here it would not require a very large sale to give us money enough to reach there didn't you write them you would be there on saturday my dear lizzie i said if it was the lord's will and i certainly meant it lizzie laughed a perplexed laugh as one only half convinced but she arose and began to pile the books in decorous order ready so she said for other fussy fingers to disarrange meantime i have need to go back with you over a thickly strewn road and let you take your bearings the last chapter closed with Jeanie on her couch of suffering this one opens with the same story and for all that appears one may have closed yesterday and the other opened today but the sad fact is that there intervenes a period of nearly three years a marvelous record have those years i have studied long over the story wondering how i could give it to you in the brief space which i may use and i have finally turned the life pages sorrowfully knowing that i cannot do it the utmost is a hint of how the time has passed so far as daily experiences are concerned two words might cover a great portion of the history suffering and poverty always on that couch often blind from excessive pain often unable to move even so much as her hand to her face to brush away a fly often unable to rest for a moment day or night because of pain often unable to imagine from where the next bread would come since she knew the last slice had been served for her yet always remembering that she lay in the hands of him who fed the five thousand with five loaves and who said to the sick of the palsy i will be thou whole this in brief is her story and yet how little it tells how little can any mere words tell of that life history it seems a pity if only there were some way for you to know it all but there is another and a curious part to the record do you remember that first journey on the cars to a religious meeting taken with such fear and trembling such shrinking from tongues and eyes as can be better imagined by the sensitive than described it might be almost said that these three intervening years 
were repeatals of that experience. Certainly few in health travel more miles or accomplish more of what is usually called public work than did Jeanie. The baggage cars on many great railroad lines became familiar ground to her, and train men her tried and approved friends. Hundreds of miles, westward, southward, she journeyed, always with the same shrinking heart, the same struggle, known only to the mother and the very few who were admitted to inner confidence, always with the same marked assurance, made plain even to the eyes of close observers around her, that, for some reason not understood by them, nor by her, the master directed this strange path for her tired body, forced into notoriety of almost every sort, from which her soul shrank, made to feel that, although she was hourly in the furnace of suffering, it was not for even such an one to say, I cannot, much less, I will not. Very few understood her. There were even Christians, who listened to her clear, quiet, singularly impressive voice, as the simple, earnest words flowed out to them from the cot placed on the platform of some great church, and went away saying, one to another, that what she said was good, and she seemed to be wonderfully in earnest. But how she could so expose herself to public gaze was beyond their comprehension." Still, people grew used to anything, they supposed. Certainly she did not mind it in the least. Yet the fact was, she never grew used to it, always quivered and trembled over the gazing eyes and the possible words, and shed her hot tears, and prayed her earnest prayer in secret to be shielded. And in public, as often as she felt the way plainly pointed out, bore her cross with quiet voice. Railroad meetings, held at some depot, waiting sometimes for a midnight train, sometimes for a belated morning one, grew to be common occurrences to her, grew indeed to be less trying in many respects than the formal church meetings, because the train men were almost invariably sympathetic, grave, and thoughtful. Many of them had seen enough of her sufferings to understand something of the burden of her cross, and enough of her patient endurance to make them sure she had a strength of bearing her which was unknown to them, and which they fain coveted for their own responsible and dangerous lives. And yet I would not have you think that it was all cross-bearing to Jeanie. Never did workers rejoice over the rewards strewn along their path more than she, and many were the fruits of her offering, souls redeemed, consecrated, fully committed to the master's service, were given to her, sometimes in scores, in return for her sacrifice. Oh, there are two sides to the record and I find it just as difficult to show you this side as the other. There is, however, a solemn light coming which will shine so strongly on this page of time as to enable you to read it for yourself. Then you will know and feel that the joy of harvest swept over and almost overshadowed the pain of service. But, oh, the tongues! If there were some way of making you understand what that sick one bore from them, I am persuaded you would appreciate Jeremiah's symbol of arrows as never before, and, it may be, you would guard your thoughtless words with greater care, lest they might, perchance, wound unintentionally some of the Lord's little ones. I asked Jeanie once the same question which I have told you her sister Fanny asked, what was, among the so-called little things, the hardest of all to endure? I cannot forget the impressive silence for a moment, and then the slow-spoken, gentle words. The sneers and stings of my fellow Christians, with whom I expect to live in heaven forever. Some of the words, which were purely thoughtless, 
without the suspicion of a sting, were yet hard to bear. Sometimes they were repeated to her in pure good nature, as something which would simply amuse her for a moment. As, for instance, one evening, after a weary ride on the cars, when the couch and its burden were rolled at last into the sitting-room of a quiet home, a gentleman sat down beside her, laughing, as he said, "'I heard of your arrival. Some people passing me on the street remarked that the sick preacher had come.' She smiled bravely, this poor, tired girl. She would not for a moment let the kind heart know that he had wounded her. But some nerves— being often bruised, are very sore. I can hardly explain to you how Jeanie, who reverenced the very title which belonged to God's chosen ambassadors, winced at this. The outraged nerves throbbed so persistently that evening that Jeanie was forced to lie quietly at home while the real preachers went to the service without her, but she sent her message. "'Won't you tell them I am not a preacher? "'I am only a simple little errand girl, "'too weak and tired tonight to do my errand.' "'And in connection with just such experiences as this "'was that cowardly Satan's opportunity. "'How busy he was about her, "'not only that evening but the next day, "'for the pain and excessive weakness continued.' "'You are a pretty errand girl,' he murmured to her tired brain. "'Come all this distance for nothing but to lie here and make trouble for other people. Cannot even show yourself to the crowds who are gathering, just out of curiosity, to see you. If you were at home with your mother, you would not be suffering so much, and you might be able to do something for the good of somebody.' but here you are just a hindrance to the people who are willing to work. And, as is oftener the case with Satan than he seems to understand, he overreached his mark. Cannot even show yourself. Yes, she could. Suppose she were too weak to lift her voice so as to be heard, save by the two or three close to her, at least she could show how keen was her interest in the work which had called her there by being present at the meetings. Yes, and then they will say you were so anxious to exhibit yourself that you could not even stay away when you were speechless, whispered Satan, and this time Jeanie heeded the whisper not at all. Of course, they would say all manner of things, she often had that battle to fight, but she had gotten beyond it now. If the evil one was, indeed, determined to put obstacles in the way of her appearance at the church that night, he should at least have a hard fight for it. She would be wheeled over there, if the pain would quiet long enough to let her. And if she could not speak at all, why, then, she could not— and her part of the responsibility would cease. And the pain quieted, and she went. And I do not know that ever, in all her years of prayer, had Jeanie prayed as she did, aloud, in a distinct, calm voice that night. She did not know the evening's story until afterward. Indeed, she never heard the whole of the story. She waits for that, but this piece was enough to explain to her Satan's anxiety about the meeting. Ned Holmes was there, a hard man, hard even in his own estimation. He had chosen that evening and that meeting for the purpose of turning the whole thing into ridicule, and the Holy Spirit had chosen that as the evening, and Jeanie Barrett as the medium, through whom a last call should be made to Ned Holmes. And poor Ned, steeped in sin, wrecked in body, with but a few weeks more on this side, actually at that eleventh hour for him, heard and heeded. No fun-making that evening. Serious business was at hand. Only a few weeks thereafter, Jeanie's couch was rolled down the street, across the road, 
to Ned's sick room. He wanted to hear her pray. He wanted her carefully marked Bible for his own. At least, he regarded it with such wistful eyes that it was transferred to his keeping. And his good-bye words to her were, Tell the people over there, meaning at the church, If the Lord can save Ned Holmes, who has been a slave to sin all his life, he can save anybody. And the Lord saved him. It was not long afterward that he passed through the valley, made so light to him by the presence of the Saviour, that no one who looked on doubts where the sinner is today. It is only one of many stories which it would give me much joy to tell you. Though Jeanie's youthful days were gone, her heart remained young and fresh. She was welcomed everywhere among that mysterious class of persons known as the girls. Many were the trophies from their number, won by her gentle words and ways. A group of them were gathered about her one day, eager in talk, and the conversation turned on the subject of coveting. Some of them merrily, and some of them earnestly, gave voice to some wish of their heart so intense that it might almost bear the name covet. At last one of them appealed to Jeanie. Now, Miss Jeanie, it is your turn. We know you don't really covet anything. We are only supposing a case, you know. I'm afraid I almost covet one thing, was Jeanie's answer, and I want you to guess what it is. Then there was a chorus of tongues. Oh, they knew what it was. She wanted to get well. No? Then she wanted her eyes to be well and strong. Not that? And one sweet-voiced girl said, speaking low, I think she wants to go home to heaven. But to these and many other suggestions, Jeanie answered always with a negative. The girls grew puzzled and excited. And finally, almost in a clamor, begged to know at once what it could possibly be, for they had guessed everything. You haven't touched the thought, girls. I really have caught myself coveting the time and strength you waste so lavishly. They laughed a little, and blushed a good deal, and kissed her, and caressed her, and went away, some of them thoughtful and from this little talk there sprang fruit which blooms in heaven to-day. Passing over, with this brief outline of the years, all the interesting details, let me bring you back to that book-strewn room and the perplexities of the hour. The books, as you have doubtless surmised, were Jeanie's own. By dint of earnest persistence in a task which was by no means light, she had succeeded in putting on paper some of the more marked features of her strange story. It was not so well done as it would have been if the writer had been less humble and modest. She shrank, even on paper, from the public gaze. She passed over, in almost silence, days of suffering with which people might have sympathized if they had understood it better. Sometimes the story of a whole month of agony was compressed into some such sentence as this. In March, I was very sick again. They did not think I could live. One thing she carefully magnified throughout the volume. That was the guarding, protecting care of her heavenly father. It was the strong reason which she could see for bringing her life before the public, that they might see how good it was to have a father. Now that her book was fairly before the world, the next thing was to sell it. There were so many willing to look the volumes over, so few ready to pay money for them. Yet, on the sale of these books depended the journey now under discussion. Apparently, so far as she could read her directions, Jeanie was to attend the Ocean Grove meeting, and yet the means with which to do so were not forthcoming. "'They will come,' Jeanie said with a smile, and went away in her cot to an afternoon prayer meeting. 
serene she was and at rest since the father had taken from her all power to rise up and help with swift feet in the work to be done around her she could go with clear conscience and happy heart to the place of prayer the cot was wheeled into its accustomed place and while its occupant waited for the services to begin there came one of those busy mothers in israel who know how to work as well as pray and kneeling beside her said eagerly i'll tell you what it is Jeanie. your books are not pushed as they ought to be i have been thinking about it something ought to be done and if you'll let me i'll do it the smile on Jeanie's face was pleasant to see here was the father's answer aloud she only said that this matter was in the hands of her friends what they thought best to do she would be grateful for but she was not surprised though some of the most enterprising workers were when the result of the afternoon sales were counted and there was found to be enough to speed the travellers oceanward there is some great reason why i am to go said Jeanie with smiling eyes i don't know what it is but i have felt sure all day that i was to go yet could you have seen her bearing with blanching face and set lips the terrible pain which the jolting cars inflicted you would not have thought it a matter of rejoicing that the way had opened indeed during the night when the pain was at its height even Jeanie's faith faltered i can hardly bear it she said with quivering lips and then her closed eyes and clasped hands told the two faithful watchers at her side to what source she had fled for strength she smiled upon them presently it seemed to me for a while she said as though i must have made a mistake the suffering is so much greater than usual that i thought my father could not have meant me to come after all but he says there is no mistake i am to go and i am to bear what pain he will i can do it now the everlasting arms are around me in a very peculiar manner i think that is cant said a christian lady reading this story from Jeanie's own account nothing but cant yet she read in her bible that evening my grace is sufficient for thee the eternal god is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms when thou passest through the waters i will be with thee and she seemed to believe the words why when one of his storm-tossed children fled to them and claimed the promise and received her answer should this christian woman consider it can't i do not know how to answer the question do you end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty five of spun from fact by pansy the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five so utterly helpless it is possible you may be quite unfamiliar with hospital life let me take you into Jeanie barrett's room for a little visit it is a large sunny room spotlessly neat and clean carpeted and curtained with walls hung with mottoes each of which breathes a lesson of courage and faith between the windows hang and grow some lovely blooming plants in baskets a bouquet of cut flowers is on the table near at hand on the mantel ticks a cheery little clock and at the farther end of the room in a niche which seems to have been built for it is an organ choice furnishing this for a public hospital i once heard a wise woman say after gazing at a photograph of the room which i have just pictured seems to me they are a little too lavish with their money for a public building plenty of people would like organs if they could get them and i am sure i can't afford cut flowers in winter bless her dear small heart if she had waited for a bit of information 
she would have learned that not a cent of what she called public money was devoted to these luxuries. The neatness, the cleanliness, and the careful regard to ordinary comfort belonged to the hospital proper, but the pictures and books and other luxuries which jarred my friend's sense of justice were each and all the gifts of loving hearts drawn out in sympathy for the life shut into one room and one corner of it. The hanging baskets and the cut flowers, the latter made fresh each week, breathed out through the winter the perfume of love from one true woman's heart, who constantly brought them as her token. The little clock ticked the thoughtful kindness of another giver, and the organ, as it filled the room with melody, spoke loudly of still another. Stranger friends they nearly all were, or they would have been strangers but for that bond of fellowship, stronger than any human tie, which linked them as children of one common father, each journeying by different paths to the same home. Perhaps this is as good a time as any to tell you that the friend who bethought himself to send the sweet-voiced organ to fill some lonely hours did not content himself with that, but all through the winter came once a week and touched its keys with skill and sang his songs, which filled the heart of more than one sufferer with peace. It was wonderful to Jeanie how many friends she found. You should hear her tell about it. How they came, one after another, to visit her in her chamber of peace. Honored names, Mrs. Bishop Simpson, of whom she quaintly said, Her call was profitable, spiritually and temporally. And Philip Phillips, the sweet singer in Israel, who sat down to that selfsame organ and sang her some of his sweetest songs and T. S. Arthur, the noted temperance author, and ministers almost numberless, as well as many other friends who came regularly with their words of cheer and their songs and their prayers. Certainly the sweet life lived in that room shone for many during that eventful winter. There is a great company of witnesses who might be called upon to testify to the faith and the calm and the strength of heart to suffer all the Father's will which they found in that upper chamber. But you are waiting, if I mistake not, with some degree of anxiety to hear the story of her hopes in regard to relief from pain. Yes, I am coming to it. There was a time when no singers came into the still room, no visitors were admitted. The skilled nurse and the attending physicians moved with cat-like tread, and the young sister's face was like marble, and the weight of years seemed to rest upon her in her great and almost overwhelming anxiety. Dr. Morland had carried out the intention which had been in his heart from the first meeting with Jeanie years before, and an operation, requiring great skill and almost infinite care, had been performed. The solemn question now was, would the patient rally from the effects of it? For days not only, but for weeks, it seemed more than doubtful. By the slenderest possible thread hung that feeble life. So sure were those who had most knowledge on the subject, that the life would go out, that they questioned the special physician or nurse from time to time, is she living yet? You may imagine what these passing days were to the younger sister. She had been with Jeanie before, when she watched momently for the fluttering breath to cease, but always, at these times heretofore, she had had her human tower of strength, her mother, to lean upon. Now the mother and all the kindred were far away, save only this young girl, and on the cot lay one unconscious, almost lifeless, who, it was more than probable, would never speak again. And this was to be the end. How much better, mourned the stricken young heart, to be at home with mother and the rest. We could help each other bear it but now it is hard for them and hard for me. I am all alone. No, dear heart, not yet the end. 
There are other experiences than these for you and Jeanie. Neither are you alone. The Heavenly Father watches and waits and has perfect knowledge of it all. He will not forget. Slowly, slowly came the weary brain back to consciousness of life. The sluggish blood quickened ever so little in its channels, the almost quiet heart took up its steadier pace, and Jeanie opened her eyes to earth once more. Ah, if you could but have seen her face in that first moment of consciousness! Where am I? she asked, and for a moment the thought of her heart was that earth was at last and forever over, and she was at home. Why? Oh, I would that I might describe to you the why, so that for a single moment it might seem to you what it did to her. Put into language, especially written on paper, it sounds very tame, almost commonplace. It was only this. The wheeled cot, with its iron-bound and bolted coffin, which had held her limb captive for so many years, was not there at all, and Jeanie lay quiet, moveless, upon a bed, such a bed as other sufferers occupied, no marble weight or bolts or bars, free and still. A broad, smooth bed, covered with white, neatly made up, like other beds, which she had lain and looked at, and imagined how they would feel, lain and looked at, and imagined, and never tried for years. Now her head rested back on one of those plump, white pillows at which she had looked with longing eyes. Too large for her cot, but fitting her so restfully now. Was it not worth all the expense and all the pain? If you had longed as many years as Jeanie had for the freedom which even a common bed affords, you would be sure to answer that question in the affirmative. And now the days passed on with even tread. To Jeanie and to the watchful physicians, it seemed almost as though the maker of the human frame had said to human skill, Thus far shalt thou go, but no further. Apparently all that medical science could do for Jeanie had been done. It was a great deal. No heart ever beat in more grateful throbs than hers over it all. But there she lay on her back, helpless as to any movement of her own. One limb still, indeed. Oh, what a blessing! No terrible convulsive throbbings, no being tossed about whither she would not. But, on the other hand, terribly still. As utterly so, as far as movement of hers was concerned, as it would be when the final coffin enclosed it. No strength returned to the nerveless back, and as the days went by, the utter silence of the physicians, whom she anxiously questioned, gave her nothing to feed her hopes upon. Yet they lived, despite all her efforts to let them go and rest content in that quiet shelter, a bed. She prayed much over it. She read, or had read to her, many books on sweet submission to the divine will. She longed exceedingly for this complete submission, and could not feel that she had it. She read other books, and listened eagerly to talk, running in the line of the power of the human will over disease. They encouraged her these talks. She led the conversation into such channels as often as she could. It had always been plain to her that, whatever else she might have lacked, she was gifted with a very strong will. Indeed, she had reason to be sure of this. It had given her much trouble to keep it in subjection. Plans arranged in every detail by her eager brain, and carried out often when lookers-on had said it was impossible, had been in brief the history of her life. Some of her bitterest hours had been because of certain schemes, dear to her heart, which could not be carried out. "'It is so very hard to give up one's own way,' she said to a friend once, with a look halfway between a smile and a tear. "'I think one's will is the last thing to yield, and it seems to me it never wholly yields after all, 
but keeps rising up and asserting itself. She had occasion to remember this afterward. Almost three months since the operation which had freed her from bolts and bars had been performed, and daily the careful treatment from the physicians had been given, and still no improvement. Rather, she seemed to grow steadily worse. She began to realize that the treatment, which it had been hoped would do something for the lifeless nerves of her spine, was being continued more to keep her from sinking into utter despair than because they had any hope of results. One evening, when the skillful manipulations belonging to the movement cure were in progress, a feeling of almost desperation seized poor Jeanie. They should succeed. If willpower could do anything, now was the time for the will to assert itself with power. The miserable, helpless limb should move. She would bear the touch of the operator on the shrinking, suffering back. It must be born, and it should be. With set teeth and white face and hands that were clinched in pain, the struggle went on until great drops of sweat stood out all over the body and then a sudden blank. The alarmed physicians began eagerly to apply restoratives, to hurry the frightened nurses hither and thither at their bidding, and yet it seemed to them all that the end had been reached at last. Will power had exerted itself to such a degree that every vestige of strength had been exhausted in the struggle. "'Don't ever be guilty of doing any such thing again,' said the attending physician, when, after long hours, she rallied. His voice was almost stern, and the words which followed the command, though kind, were very firm and searching. There was a time when the exertion of willpower became rebellion against the god of power, nay, when such exertion became suicide, and a Christian, one who trusted wholly in the goodness and loving-kindness of the Lord, was not the one to set up a human will in rebellion. Poor Jeanie was meek, outwardly, and penitent. Yet it was just at this time that she wrote in her journal, I cannot think of the future but with agitation. Oh, the thought of never, after all I have suffered, of never walking a step. How can I bear it? Oh, I need the prayers of God's children. I do not want to be self-willed. No mortal knows what it is I experience. I am so helpless, so utterly helpless. And when at times it flashes over me that I must remain so, and must be reconciled, oh, for grace to overcome. All these years I have been sustained by the belief that, if my father did not take me home, he would set me on my feet again. Sometimes I scarce knew whether the hope that I was to walk in heaven or on earth was stronger. But it was always there. Oh, my father, can I give it up? Do you know, dear sympathetic friends who read these lines, that there is one thought which fills me, even now, with such great throbs of indignation that I can hardly write? And that is, of the people who looked on the surface of this life, even at this time of extremest human need, and went their ways and said, in defiance of all the words spoken by physicians of such acknowledged skill and eminence, that it would seem as though they might be believed, what a pity that poor Jeanie cannot exercise her willpower! I believe she could get better if she could only try! Poor idiots! I ought to feel sorry for them, I suppose. But, despite my efforts, indignation gets the upper hand. You see, I, in common with all those about the sufferer, knew so well all the history of her strong-willed life, and was so thoroughly acquainted with the struggle which at this time was going on, that it was hard to be patient with what seemed just willful ignorance." but I trust you know enough of divine love to be sure that he did not leave this child of his tossing helplessly among the billows of despair 
which had suddenly rolled over her. That wailing cry, Oh, for grace to overcome, was assuredly heard at the throne, and, ere nightfall, he sent his angel to comfort her. The very peace of heaven itself seemed to rest on Jeanie's face not long afterward, and her smile was as sweet and bright as ever. She had been reading a few lines from Spurgeon, and the dear Lord spoke to her through them. She pointed out the closing sentence with a significant hint that it held her fixed resolve. As for his failing you, never dream of it. Banish the thought. The God who has been sufficient until now can surely be trusted to the end. But with the rest of faith came no rest to the suffering body. In fact, if it were possible for her to suffer more severely than before, perhaps that evening in March stands out as the time when pain seemed to reach its height and refused to be subdued by any effort. In vain did Dr. Moreland make use of all the appliances which his skill could suggest. It seemed as nothing, and the throbbing head said to its victim that, unless relief came soon, surely her reason could not bear the strain. Oh, for a physician who could speak the word of power to this demon of pain! There was such an one. Why did they not fly to him? Jeanie turned suffering eyes on her doctor and spoke with all the intensity which pain gave. Oh, doctor, how is your faith? Can't you, can't you take hold with me and ask the Lord to help me? Oh, don't you think it must be his will? The grave, sad face looked kindly down on hers in which every nerve was drawn with suffering and there was a quiver of feeling in the voice which replied, Poor child, I believe in his power even as you do, and, as I may be able, I will certainly join with you in claiming his promise, that, where two or three are gathered, as touching anything, it shall be given them. A moment more, and he added solemnly, Shall not this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo these many years be loosed then immediately he dropped upon his knees and began to pray dear friend do you believe in the power of prayer do you rest fully in the assurance that god is able to do all things and that he has promised help to those who put their trust in him if so why should you be astonished when i declare to you that suddenly in the twinkling of an eye all pain ceased, and that tortured frame, which but a moment before had writhed and groaned under its hand, was entirely and sweetly at rest. It is hard to believe. I know you find it so. If I were writing fiction, I should hesitate over this and avoid it, as belonging to the things called improbable. Such faithless people are we who pray, but I am writing simple truth, and I ask you to consider it thoughtfully. Do I mean that all pain may be cured by prayer? That there is no necessity for physical suffering if people would pray for relief? No, I mean nothing of the kind. I do not say, nor does it logically follow from anything which has been said, that God always answers prayer in the affirmative. Because of his wisdom, he may know that freedom from pain is not the best thing for the asking soul just then, and, if so, assuredly he will not send it. There is nothing meant but the simple and altogether reasonable thought that God sometimes gives his children the faith to ask for immediate relief from suffering, believing that the affirmative answer will come, and when he grants this faith, be sure he will meet its requirements. End of chapter 25「Chapter 24 of Spun from Fact by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24. Harbor at Last. 
Along the broad, smooth avenue, named Ocean Pathway, rolled the cot, while the eager eyes looking out from it watched for their first glimpse of old ocean. There it was, revealed before her in all its grandeur, just at the coming in of the tide, the mighty breakers tumbling in torrents of foam against the impassable shore. "'The sea sings in the golden light,' quoted Jeanie, and then suddenly hushed her voice. Words seemed just then very weak and feeble things, at least human words, but there floated through her happy heart the memory of a strain of sufficient majesty to fit even here. He maketh the sea roar, and stilleth the waves thereof. Who could be found to hush those mighty waves into silence? Even he who made them, none other. And Jeanie, weak and feeble thing, lay in his hands. Happy-hearted, though the cares of life might have pressed her heavily just then. In fact, during the weeks which followed, they did press about her, and at times well nigh engulf her. How to live was the problem. Hopes which had been held out of heavy sales of her book, if she would but come where the great throngs of people were to be found, seemed to have been vain hopes. The people were there, fifty thousand of them, in the course of the season, passed up and down the ocean pathways, and the great majority of them looked at with curious eyes and questioned about genie. But, for the most part, they contented themselves with questions, passing by her books and forgetting her as soon as their curiosity was satisfied. And the days rushed by, and the bills grew heavy, and Jeanie had to betake herself more and more to the refuge of prayer. Upon some of those days she looked back, long afterward, as a time that tried her faith to its utmost. Yet the Lord was true to his pledge, as heretofore, and sent her rest from care, even before he strengthened her faith with sight. Much of the time she spent at the beach, never weary of watching the restless sea, never being able to express the thoughts of her heart in satisfying words, save when she fled to such as these. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. One day, in the little tent where she made her home, there was an unusual commotion. Friends hurried to and fro, wearing faces of more or less anxiety. Yards and yards of bed-ticking were being torn and made into bandages. Somebody brought a heavy plank with a curiously constructed head and footboard, and the curious, stopping before the tent, saw presently that the crippled woman was bound firmly by means of the heavy bandages to the plank. The plank was resting on two chairs, bearing its living freight. Among the lookers-on was a little fellow, young enough to express his mind so that all could hear. "'Oh, mamma, that is the way they lay dead people!' The anxious sister of the bound girl heard the words, and shivered as though a cold wave from the sea had suddenly struck her. But Jeanie only smiled. She had heard such similes before. The children who played about her home had called the box in which the diseased limb was bolted a coffin, and the weight of marble which was sometimes used a tombstone. And when the new couch came home, with its side curtains of velvet, they were heard to exclaim, "'Oh, look, that is the hearse for Miss Jeanie!' The thought might be solemn, but the other world had long been too near a home to call from Jeanie a shiver over the paraphernalia connected with the closing scenes in this. She only turned pleasant eyes on the little boy and smiled. She was the only calm one of the group, yet it was an important hour to her. Unconsciously, almost, she had allowed strong hopes to cluster around this last experiment for her, a surf bath. 
it had been the undertow which had drawn her persistently through all drawbacks to the ocean in the first place it had been the goal to which she had reached forward with steady purpose ever since she came she had the word of several physicians that it might they could not say with certainty but they hoped and believed that it might possibly be of great benefit to the almost paralyzed limbs to feel the shock of the waves beating about them at least the experiment was worth trying and toward this attempt Jeanie had steadily pressed her way through what seemed at times almost insurmountable obstacles until now she was ready and they lifted her securely bound to the plank placed her in a strong hammock and then borne by ten men she went into the sea an experience to be remembered to be looked back upon as something strange and exhilarating and wonderful but not one that brought the mysterious strength for which she had longed and prayed no miracle of healing did the waters work it was beneficial i think she said afterward but she said it with an almost quivering lip strong hopes had been shattered among those who had planned this effort and assisted to carry it out and watched with professional care all the movements and watched the patient through the hours of exhaustion which followed was a certain physician who had for years been interested in genie too skilled in his profession and with too critical a knowledge of the nature of genie's disease to have any of her eager hope in regard to the experiment he yet thought it would rest and refresh her worn body and perhaps give the sluggish blood a fresh impetus at least it was worth the trial and all that he had hoped for was accomplished by the effort around the person of this doctor clustered some of the most earnest hopes of genie's life years before he had met her in a western town and been interested in her professionally as physicians were sure to be had expressed at the time the wish that she might come to the city where he lived and the hope that if he had opportunity he might be of benefit to her genie had often heard this story had often made trial of the skill of men of eminence only to be crushed under another disappointment until of late years she had learned to respond to the expressed wish with a smile of gratitude for the spirit which prompted the desire to help her and to give it scarce a thought beside to this rule there was one exception always around the name of dr morlin had lingered for genie a hope such as she could neither understand nor put away as often as she heard the name of the city which was his home there would thrill in her heart the hope that some day she might go there and be under his professional care among the happy experiences of ocean grove had been meeting again and again interesting in her peculiar case this same dr morlin the old hope grew stronger than ever before and after the ocean bath and its comparative failure genie turned her thoughts and her prayers toward securing an abiding place near this physician not an easy thing for a poor and obscure woman to do yet as i told you wherever genie went she made friends they were here in large numbers christian friends who however hopeless they might be in regard to anything that human skill could do for her yet were disposed to think that one so afflicted should have every wish of her heart gratified as far as possible in unexpected and it seemed to genie unexampled ways the path opened for her and on a certain well-remembered october day the city express delivered her cot at the front door of a hospitable home which had engaged to receive her and her friends at least it tried to open its doors wide enough for her to enter but the cot used to more room obstinately refused to pass the door of parlor or sitting-room 
poor weary genie trying to smile and keep up a brave heart though every nerve was throbbing with pain this little experience stands out among those which were peculiarly hard to bear it is not heavy trials always which unnerve us our christian faith often rises superior to these when a pin-prick would move us to tears as the cumbersome cot was backed out again down the hall not without some jars which sent the pain tingling through her nerves Jeanie felt that life certainly had some hard places for her now around to the side of the house but the inhospitable gate was as obstinate as the door and sturdily refused the guest admission the distressed family and the anxious sister hovered about the couch and exclaimed and suggested but the occupant who had gained a quiet face again smiled brightly on them and offered a merry word or two at her own expense suddenly some one thought of the board fence a little lower down and strong hands working steadily removed the boards made an entrance for the cot and it rolled in triumph through the kitchen into the sitting-room harbor at last was ever weary body more grateful for it you think now she had attained the summit of her hopes indeed not much hard waiting was yet before her she was not asking for a very great thing merely a corner in the hospital for her cot and the opportunity to seek relief from the torturing pain which haunted her day and night but even these were not so easy to obtain as you might suppose it appeared that the rules of the hospital were to receive no incurables into its wards the question was did not this effectually shut out Jeanie barrett there were trustee meetings and faculty meetings and long discussions dr morland was willing to undertake the case and test his professional skill to the utmost but he was not prepared to say that in his opinion the patient could be cured how was it possible for a hospital which was bound in honor to save its room and its attendants for those for whom there was reasonable prospect of cure to receive this one whom a great army of physicians had pronounced incurable whose experience of suffering despite all that medical skill had tried reached over not days nor months only but years and years thereby increasing the improbability of decided help genie appreciated the situation admitted that there seemed insurmountable difficulties in the way admitted that the hospital would be entirely justified in refusing her yet waited and prayed and in her secret heart believed that somehow the difficulties would be overcome meantime the weary days stretched their slow length along everybody was kind everybody tried to serve her some by urging her to give up the idea of the hospital assuring her that it could not be right for one in her situation to incur such heavy expense when in all probability it would be of no avail job's comforters were these surely but to be answered gently even gratefully because of their evident honest interest in the sufferer yet whose counsel must be pushed aside because genie living as she was during these days almost literally on prayer still heard her heavenly father's whisper to hold on her way in the dark almost a month of waiting and on saturday the seventeenth genie wrote in her journal my way is completely hedged on monday i must leave this dear home as a longer stay would seriously interfere with the necessary plans of the family whither am i to go i praise the dear lord for his keeping power in this dark hour with all the cares of this day what rest and peace i have within my heart only a few hours after that entry the darkness lifted 
word came from the president of the hospital that its doors would open to her. All arrangements had been perfected, and on Monday they should expect to see her, and her sister would be received as her special nurse. I did not need to go until Monday, Jeanie said, with her sweet bubble of laughter, speaking to me about it long afterward, and from Saturday until Monday was ample time for me to make my little preparations. Why should I not have known that my Heavenly Father would see that everything was right? Then, after a moment's thoughtful pause, Well, I did know. I felt sure he would do something, but I did not know what, and, of course, it was not necessary that I should. What a strange way of trusting it would be, if the child did not rest on his father unless he understood all the details of his plans. Oh, the gratitude of heart with which the dweller in that cot took her corner in the long ward of the hospital! just a little niche for it, her sister's bed close at hand, a small stand between them. Rows and rows of beds stretching down the length of the long hall, on either side, all occupied with sufferers. Dear friend, do you think you could have been happy, been grateful, felt that the lines were fallen unto you in pleasant places? I wish you could have had, at that moment, a glimpse of Jeanie's face. My peace flowed as a river, she said, in speaking of it afterward. But the sister had reached no such height of peace. She looked with doubtful eyes on the rows of beds. She thought of the quiet room at home, sacred to the privacy of mother and daughters, small, plain, bare, hardly what you would call the necessities of life in it, yet it was home, and no other eyes than those belonging to home had a right there. Fanny coveted such privacy for her suffering sister. Is this little space all the home we have in this great city? It was a wail right from the poor child's heart. She could not help it. She was glad for Jeanie that effort could now be made to relieve her, but she longed for six feet square of room, shut in by walls, wherein the sister might be alone. Others besides Fanny saw the need for this. It was almost a necessity, physician and matron said, but Jeanie had learned long ago to do without necessities, and expected in this instance to do without. There was a certain sunny room on which Fanny's eyes looked longingly. She made eager inquiry as to the difference in expense if they should take it, and, though appalled at the reply, her heart did not give it up. All day she worked over the problem. Among the friends who had come to them with words and deeds of kindness were the publishers of Jeanie's book. They met with hearty interest one whom they had known so long by correspondence, and were unfailing in their efforts to assist her. To one of these noble men, Fanny, on her way upstairs, after a somewhat prolonged absence from the ward, spoke her mind. "'Can't you persuade Jeanie to take that room? I want her to be there so badly. It seems to me as though it must be done.' Maybe I could get some sort of work in the hospital to help pay the extra expense. I would be willing to do anything to give Jeanie the comfort of a room alone. The eyes of the good man twinkled, but he replied gravely enough. It would be very nice, Fanny, but I must tell thee that two ladies have already taken that room and will move into it tomorrow. The disappointment was so great that to the young sister's eyes rose the tears which she in vain tried to control. Oh, she said, I am so sorry, and there is no other vacant room which is suitable, they told me. I am so sorry. Then the kind heart, which was enjoying its bit of pleasantry, but which never enjoyed anything at the expense of another's tears, spoke out in eager tones. 
it is true that the room is taken, but thee may not know that Jeanie Barrett and her sister are the ladies who have taken it. End of chapter 24「Chapter Twenty Six of Spun from Fact by Pansy. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Six Waiting. It was a certain Monday evening toward the middle of April. The soft breath of spring was abroad in the earth, and in Jeanie's room, an earnest of the coming flower season breathed fragrance. Jeanie, resting quietly on her white bed, which was such a luxury to her, comparatively free from pain, at peace in regard to herself, was absorbed in the experience of another. Near her bed sat a lady and gentleman in whom she was deeply interested. The lady had been a frequent visitor. Indeed, on the evening set apart each week for a little company of praying ones to gather in Jeanie's room, she had always been present." constant and earnest had been the petitions offered up with her she asked great things of the lord greater than jeanie had thought of asking for herself if people looked at these questions in the right light her husband had been for years a drunkard and for years she had wrestled with the lord for his salvation what greater miracle than this to reach a soul bent on his own ruin stretch out a helping hand to one who does not deeply feel his need for help, and lead him to the point where he realizes that help must come, or he will perish, and then make him willing to call at the right place for this help. But what infinite power could do it? Tonight, after these long months of waiting, the husband came with the wife. Part of the miracle had been performed, this victim of the curse of rum had been made willing to seek for help. In fact, he had done what he could toward helping himself, even to signing the total abstinence pledge. "'I cannot say that I am a converted man,' he said to Jeanie, "'but I know that in some respects I am changed, and I know that I want to have a changed heart.' "'Do you want to settle it now?' "'What a singularly searching question!' There was stillness in the room for a moment after Jeanie's sweet voice had asked it. Then the man said firmly, Yes, I want to settle it now. Then let us wait on the Lord until it is settled. If you have honestly given yourself to him, he will accept the gift, and I believe he will let you know that he has ratified the contract. I would like to have heard Jeanie's prayer that followed. I did not, but I have often heard her pray. I can imagine the singularly childlike confidence with which she approached her heavenly father for this great miracle of healing, this renewal, not of a poor and, at best, perishable body, but the renewing of a never-dying soul. Then the wife prayed. This was no new sound. Everyone present had heard again and again the cry of that soul for her husband's conversion. But the momentary silence which followed was broken by a new voice. The old story so often repeated, so gloriously new to each one of whom it may be said, Behold, he prayeth. Can you imagine sweeter music for the ears of the listening wife? Has any human tongue ever been able to describe that miracle of miracles, whereby, in a moment of time, a soul feels itself new-born, all its desires and aspirations changed? I do not know how to write of it. I always stand in awe before the manifestation, glad that I have a God of power to rest my faith upon." But there are other manifestations of his power, less frequently exhibited possibly as of old, because of unbelief, yet not less certain, surely, to those who feel his hand. On the bed lay Jeanie, closed eyes, folded hands, every feature of her quiet face showing that her soul was joining in the prayer of thanksgiving which the saved soul was pouring out. 
suddenly over her face there came a startled change, a look of astonishment, of awe, melting rapidly into one of radiant delight. She opened her eyes and glanced quickly from one to another of the kneeling group, with a curious feeling that they must know of what had come to her, but they knew only that a soul had been newly born, and that all the golden harps of heaven were ringing out the chorus of the angel's joy. In utmost stillness, Jeanie waited for the prayer to be concluded, for the tender words of fellowship which followed, then spoke her message. I have something to tell you. The healer came to me also. The same physician who can heal the sin-sick soul, bless the Lord, has power over that lesser handiwork of his, the body. While our dear friend here prayed, suddenly there came to me a feeling as though a mighty hand were laid upon my back, and, as if it were an electric shock, I felt strength come to that weak spot from which we thought the nerve power gone for ever. Oh, dear friends, I know you will pray for me. I believe my heavenly Father means to manifest his power even in me. They bowed again in prayer, and the wife, whose faith had received such an uplift in return for her long waiting, poured out her soul again, this time for bodily healing. When the happy hour was over, and Jeanie was alone with her sister and the hospital nurse, Fanny came toward her with tender voice. "'Poor little girl, she must be very tired. It was a longer meeting than usual. Let me take away the headrest and get you ready for sleep.' There was no reply beyond a slight motion of the hand. Then, after a moment, Jeanie said, "'Oh, let me be, please, just a little. I am so at rest and so happy.' The radiant look was still on her face, and they waited, feeling as though to disturb her would be to interrupt communion with an unseen presence. Fanny went softly from the room, intent upon preparations for the night. As she returned, glass of milk in hand, with which to refresh her patient, the nurse had lifted Jeanie's head to remove the rest, but instead of its falling to one side as usual, like the head of a few days old infant, Jeanie held it erect and said, with a clear, happy voice, Fanny, see me! But the young sister had never seen her able to exert that much power over her body before. Is it any wonder that she screamed in terror? They calmed down at last, and everything was made quiet for the night. Never was a happier heart than throbbed on that bed in the corner. Jeanie slept and wakened, and, like a child with a new and wonderfully treasured toy, which she is afraid will in some way escape her, tried again and yet again her new-found strength, and found it stayed with her and laughed out in her glee and gratitude, and prayed her grateful word of prayer, and slept and wakened only to apply over and over again the same test. So passed the happy night. The morning found her radiantly happy. "'What kind of a night had you?' Fanny asked in a somewhat self-reproachful tone. "'I think I must have slept much more soundly than usual. I hardly heard you at all.' A good night, Fanny, dear. I slept some and practiced a great deal. Practiced? Yes, with that curious little laugh, which seems always to bubble up from the heart of a child. My new accomplishment, you know. She had many calls that day, some of them of marked interest. Among others came a dear friend, who had often, during the winter, sat with her and knelt beside her in prayer. "'I have something to tell you,' Jeanie said, turning happy eyes on her. "'Something good.' "'Is it so? Then I want to hear it. But first I have something to tell you, or say to you. Jeanie, I have been thinking about you all day. I cannot help feeling that you are going to be made well. It seems to me it is your privilege to ask God to heal you.' "'I will,' said Jeanie, her eyes bright, though the tears were gathering. "'Pray with me, dear friend, 
ask as distinctly as you please but first i will strengthen your faith let me tell you my news the next caller of note was one of the brothers from her publishing house bringing with him friends from several states everybody who heard of Jeanie was interested in her her special friend had been trying to tell her story to the others and turned to her for dates just how long is it Jeanie, since thee could sit up or help thyself in any way i was never able to help myself in the least for sixteen years until last night what he turned toward her a startled gaze and repeated his exclamation in the form of a question what did thee say well just steady my shoulders a little bit and i will show you he obeyed her directions and up came the long helpless head holding itself erect the eyes very bright and the ever ready laugh bubbling forth but the one who had known her so well was moved almost beyond words for a moment yet he struggled for and found appropriate speech bless the lord o oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name who forgiveth all thine iniquities who healeth all thy diseases then such a prayer as followed it is not often one's privilege to hear yet what a little thing it was the power to hold her own head erect and steady a power which is given to you and me each minute of the long days how many prayers of thanksgiving have we offered for this blessing sometimes when i think of the overwhelming gratitude with which Jeanie received this gift of strength to do that which is to me one of the most trivial and commonplace of all the movements of my body i am filled with wonder not at her gratitude but at my indifference it is so hard to remember that each movement of this fearfully and wonderfully made machine the human body is of the lord and that he thinks about and cares for it all the time despite our thoughtlessness and ingratitude and the numerous devices by which we contrive to thwart his love and care and derange the organs which he has placed and manipulated with such infinite skill and now you shall spend one more evening with me in Jeanie's room a lovely spring evening but the outside world though fair enough was not what held the attention of our friends at the hospital Jeanie's room wore an unusually holiday air it had been made as bright and fair as was possible for loving hands and the breath of newly blossomed flowers filled the air it was Jeanie's reception evening not the usual circle which was wont to gather in her room each tuesday evening but a company of invited guests they had been summoned with utmost care after hours and indeed i might say days of prayerful consideration had you been skilled in the study of the human face you would have seen that on each of these faces rested an air of unusual interest that a feeling which might almost be termed expectancy hovered about the room they had been invited not for merely social purposes nor to help pass a pleasant hour but to join with this long-tried servant of god in asking her heavenly father not to cure her body but to reveal then and there his will concerning her to give her a definite and settled answer to the long questioning cry of her heart all of the circle were settled believers in the power of prayer all of them had tested its water for themselves and received unmistakable assurances that god hears not only but replies to the call of his servants what better company than this could be gathered to ask unitedly according to his revealed plan for that which they desired three of the gentlemen present were clergymen friends of long years standing one of them had been Jeanie's pastor in her faraway home years before and knew every step of the weary way by which she had come to this hour the brothers from her publishing house with their wives were in this chosen circle as friends who knew how to pray her beloved physician 
who delighted in giving testimony, as often as opportunity afforded, that what skill he had in relieving bodily suffering, he believed was of the Lord, sat very near the reclining chair in which Jeanie rested. Seated about the room were others who, for various reasons, were specially interested in Jeanie, and specially drawn to join in the prayer of this evening. The week which had preceded this coming together had been one of peculiar interest to Jeanie. She felt more vividly, perhaps, than the others could, that the prayer circle was larger than appeared. She knew of groups of long-tried friends who would, in answer to her petition, gather tonight to remember her. She knew of some, mighty in prayer, who would go alone to meet the angel of the covenant and plead for her. And all the week she had been upborne by the memory of the one who said, Where two of you shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done. No word he hath spoken was ever yet broken. This little couplet, familiar to her childhood, floated through her brain, and was grasped hold of and rested upon. She believed it. Looking back over her eventful life, perhaps no experience is more vivid to Jeanie than that week of waiting. The word waiting just expresses the conviction of her mind. God would, in some way, she knew not how, reveal to her fully his gracious will concerning her future. Whether she was to lie on her bed and suffer and smile and be patient for his sake, or whether he could and would use her in other ways. I have passed through the bitterness, she said to a friend. He has taken it away. It is blessed in him to be willing to give me definite knowledge, but it is a sweeter thing to give me this sense of rest. Even if I am to lie still all the years that are left, I feel it will be sweet to do it, if in this way I can most honor him but as to that i do not know he has not given me any answer yet i am waiting end of chapter 26《chapter 27 the final chapter of spun from fact by pansy the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter 27 and if it be thy will in utmost absence from anything like excitement, the hour of prayer passed. At its close, one of the number, a minister, crossed the room to Jeanie's side. "'I shall have to go,' he said. "'I have an engagement at this hour which I am compelled to meet. But before I go, I feel constrained to say this word to you, dear suffering sister. You are asking too much.' I feel sure you are too anxious to get well. I believe the Lord can make better use of you on your cot than on your feet. And if such is the case, surely you, his servant, ought to be willing to bear the cross for him. Think of what he bore for you. The long-suffering sister Fanny felt the blood rush hotly to her face. What did this man know of their genie's life of unutterable suffering and absolute self-amnegation? Was it fitting to speak such words to such an one as she, whose every breath for twenty years had been that of pain, and whose thought had been always of others, not of self? But genie's brow was calm and her voice gentle and meek. "'Thank you, dear friend.' I know how important it is to be honest with one's self, but I can truthfully and joyfully tell you this. I am not too anxious to get well. That part of the conflict is past. If the heat of the furnace is to be to me in the future sevenfold what it has been in the past, I am ready to say, Thy will be done. I can feel that the opportunity to honor him in bearing pain would be sweet, but what he has promised me now, if I have understood him aright, is that he will graciously still the questioning of my heart, and reveal to me what is his will in regard to my future. The minister smiled on her, a half-pitying smile, 
such as he might give to a silly child who was demanding special attention from one altogether too busy to heed her childish wishes but at the same time as one who thought she was very winning in her childishness and he would be glad to help her if he could then he went away apparently without the remembrance of him who is never so busy that even a sparrow falls not without his knowledge and who has signally particularized his care over his children by the minute description even the very hairs of your head are all numbered after the minister's departure the circle closed around genie her quiet voice was speaking to them dear friends is there a oneness of mind among us if our father keeps us waiting before him until morning can you tarry with me i feel that he will have us wait on him in this matter the first firm voice to answer was that of the christian physician i will stay until morning if need be he said and count it a privilege to wait on my lord in prayer so long as he will then the murmur of assent and agreement as to the privilege of the hour passed from lip to lip among the little company and the next hour slipped quietly away it was after ten o'clock a very quiet meeting earnest prayer evincing by its very hush of tone its intensity frequently a sweet song of praise floated out of the night air many precious bible verses were repeated as they were suggested to one and another of the waiting company as for genie she lay back quiet in her chair suffering much pain of body it had been a day of unusual weakness and prostration if present experience counted for anything the master had spoken to her all day through that long-suffering body child it is my will that you glorify me still a little longer through pain and weakness the prostration had not been so great for several days as it was on this well-remembered one yet her face expressed only utmost calm there were lines of pain about the closed eyes the physical marks of what the body was enduring but the mouth had triumphed over them and rested without a quiver suddenly in the hush which followed a softly sung verse of a hymn her voice still quiet rose distinctly on the air father i am constrained at this moment to give myself anew and unreservedly to thee i give this body anew these eyes to see these lips to talk these ears to hear and if a pause amid such a hush as could be felt in the heart throbs of those waiting then the quiet voice went on if it be thy will these feet to walk for jesus all that there is of me all all is thine my father only let thy dear will be done then the hush fell on them again a strange hush as if caused by some unearthly presence brooding over them genie still lying with closed eyes and the drawn black lines underneath which always told of physical pain suddenly her eyes opened a look swept over her face not unlike that which you have sometimes seen on the face of the dying who lie in confident expectation of soon being at home she laid hold of the arms of her chair and raised herself to a sitting posture the watching doctor kneeling by her side turned suddenly and with noiseless hands let down the footboard of the reclining chair why there had never before been need to change its position for those two bound feet the two friends who were nearest her moved by common impulse sprang forward with outstretched hands but it was without help from them that the long quiet feet obeyed the mandate which had come to them and bore their burden firmly could you expect quiet after that the poor young sister who had never seen her darling genie on her feet before and who had been wrought up during these last few minutes to the highest pitch of anxious excitement when she saw what was to her as strange a sight as though the dead had suddenly started into life 
sprang to her own feet and screamed in accents of utmost terror oh genie genie it was a different feeling but a no less deep emotion which prompted the old man who had sprung to her possible aid to lay his trembling hand on genie's head and repeat with quivering voice praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host praise father son and holy ghost as for the happy girl who stood erect radiant no greater transformation than that which had suddenly swept over her face blotting out all traces of suffering can be imagined just a moment she stood smiling then said let us pray and turning dropped upon her knees with as much ease and grace as though the long stiffened joints had done her bidding each day instead of there having intervened a blank of seventeen years between her last kneeling and this hour every knee was bowed and a solemn hush of prayer swept over the company not a word was spoken but there is no doubt in the mind of any of that privileged number as to the fact of prayer nor do any of them doubt but that the angel of the covenant who had come so near to them lingered for this acknowledgment of his power and goodness rising after a few moments genie her face still radiant as a child's moved easily across the room no trembling in the limbs no prickling sensation in the long unused feet no hesitancy as to whether her next step would prove firm i am made over anew she said with the joyous laugh bursting all bounds and bubbling forth my sick limb is gone there is not an ache nor a pain about me what were they to say or do that company they were spellbound too amazed at the result of their own asking to realize that they were in the body at all the doctor was the first to recover himself and assert his professional authority in a most peremptory manner he ordered his late patient back to bed in vain she pleaded that she was not tired had never felt less so in her life that every nerve throbbed with energy and joy that at last at last she was free from pain he was inexorable and would not let her take another step but had her lifted like a child and carried back to prison it was not possible for doctor and nurse to realize that their occupation as caretakers was so utterly gone from them when before had a patient been known even under the most favorable circumstances to spring suddenly from a condition of long helplessness into buoyant health if the doctors had cured her altogether said the nurse looking on with eyes which in their astonishment seemed almost to refuse to believe what they were gazing on if the doctors had done it it would have taken months for her to learn how to walk and here she trots off as though she had walked but yesterday if human doctors had done it you mean said one reverently and then the thoughts of each went back to that other physician who when he walked on earth said to the one long sick wilt thou be made whole and then immediately take up thy bed and walk certainly the only physician on record who had ever performed such cures and he had promised to be always with those who put their faith in him there were eager listeners to the few words genie had to say concerning him yes i have been suffering all day more than usual i was in pain all the evening physical pain but very happy at heart while i lay there after i had prayed aloud there came to me almost a vision of the man with the withered arm i could seem to see him standing before the healer and hear that blessed voice say to him stretch forth thine hand but said i to my heart he cannot it is withered but said my heart to me he did he stretched it forth 
and it was not withered it was whole like the other and then like an electric thrill there came to my soul the desire and the intention to claim the same healing i felt rather than heard his voice bidding me rise up and walk i felt definitely the strength come into my helpless limb i knew it would walk and it did the doctor interrupted the talking ordered a glass of milk for his patient and then immediate quiet for the night when the milk was brought her jeanie suddenly raised herself to a sitting posture held out her hand for the glass then turning to the doctor her eyes brimming with tears said oh doctor is it i and broke into a ringing laugh then almost immediately she said oh doctor let me pray and the full heart found vent in a prayer which was like a triumphant song of thanksgiving she dropped asleep like a tired child in a few moments more and the room was filled with the light of a spring morning when she awoke with the first dawning consciousness she sat erect and it was in this position that fanny rubbing open her sleeping eyes found her patient there was no sleepiness then oh genie she said and the voice was almost as startled as on the night before oh can it be possible am i awake or am i dreaming you are very much awake said jeanie laughing at least i am fanny these are the words in my heart to thee o lord with dawning light my thankful voice i'll raise thy mighty power to celebrate thy holy name to praise fanny dear get me some clothes such as people wear who sit up and walk around i am going to dress myself think of it suiting the action to the word she rose with the dexterity of one accustomed to such accomplishments and made all speed with her toilet fanny looking on dazed almost frightened giving alarmed little squeals with every movement of the limbs so long quiet and calling forth frequent bursts of laughter from the happy sister a knock at the door interrupted them and the day attendant putting her head in at the door began will you have the and then stopped in utter bewilderment will i have the bed rest laughed jeanie confess that that is what you were going to say no thank you i am quite done with that good old friend what shall i do to convince you all that i am not an invalid i am well darling and strong don't you know it and then the two sisters mingled their happy tears together and talked between times of the mother and the wonderful news which would soon spread over the wires to her my pen pauses with this sentence while i try to decide what i will write what i will omit where i shall leave this web spun so carefully from the facts at my disposal it is easy enough to finish a work of fiction but how to close a life story when it is being lived in all its strength is the question i could fill a volume with the experiences of the next few months of the wonder that it was to meet the brisk feet of the busy woman who went hither and thither as intent on her work as she was when locked in her couch more than that could not be said of the bewilderment of old friends who met her on street corners in the stores in the omnibus anywhere that busy people go of the sensation which thrilled her the first time she did that commonplace thing sat down to a family table to partake with them of the morning meal so strange it was to her to sit erect and serve and be served like others what an experience it was to her to go through the wards of the hospital stopping at one and another suffering bedside sympathizing with them as only she could what a day it was when she started on her homeward journey how well she remembered her entry into the city the discussion with dr morland as to the best way of reaching the house where she was to stop and the cheery smile with which he said perhaps you will walk to the depot when you go away 
saying it as one says good-hearted, utterly idle words, to bring a passing smile and a moment of forgetfulness along the weary way. Idle words, indeed! Did he not stand watching her as she tripped down the long walk to the ladies' room, her step light and free, every movement betokening health and energy? "'What will the boys think?' Jeanie had said, with a merry laugh, just before she started for the train. This meant the train men, whose duty it had been to carry her cot, freighted with its heavy burden, to the baggage car. What a delight it was to grasp their hearty hands, watch the astonished gaze of dawning recognition come into their faces, and tell them she remembered their kindness, but she thought she would not ride in the baggage car this time if they wouldn't mind. It is all fairyland, she said brightly one day. At every turn there is some wonderful experience. I cannot stop to button my shoe that it doesn't fill me with astonishment to think that it was I, wearing shoes like other people, and putting them on and taking them off at will. Dear friends, I may as well close the story here as elsewhere. It is of no use for me to try to finish it. For, as I told you, it is being lived. It has been a joy to me to write this account, to add my might to the long record of events which go to prove the statement that truth is stranger than fiction. As I have told you repeatedly, as the title told you from the first, my story is spun from fact. If there is anything in it which sounds unreal, improbable, and I am aware that, as we have accustomed ourselves to understand life, there are many things, you are to remember that I am not responsible for them. If a life that is lived is unreal, if events that have actually occurred seem improbable, what are you going to do about it? Yet let me be strictly truthful in this entire matter. In the minor details of this book, I have had of necessity to draw somewhat on my imagination. That is, where I have had bare outlines of facts as they occurred, I have had to imagine some of the probable conversation with which the facts were doubtless woven. But every item of importance, every reference to prayer as a constant factor in this life, every account of answer to prayer, however improbable in its sound, is strict truth, for which I can not only vouch, but can bring a long train of witnesses to corroborate my testimony. For the matter of that, if you are in the least anxious to know how closely I have adhered to strict truth in my story, I refer you to two books, The Valley of Baca and From Baca to Beulah. These are plain, unelaborated records of facts, written by Jeanie herself, and obtainable at any first-class bookstore. You can study them with what care you please, and learn a hundred things about Jeanie and her friends, of which I have not had time to tell. And I give you leave, after a careful perusal of the volumes, to arraign me as a writer of improbable fiction, if you can. More than this, if you care to know anything of the busy, happy life which is being lived by Jeanie today, which has been lived by her every day since that eventful April evening eight years ago, I call your attention to a little book, Ramblings in Beulah Land, which at least hints at something of her work, and records some of the shadows as well as joys along her way. Life has not been all brightness to her, largely because of her Christian brethren and sisters, who, not knowing her, and not, apparently, knowing her great physician well enough to attribute to him the power necessary to make her story true, have indulged in some sneers, and some, to say the least, not brotherly or sisterly words. But, on the whole, I think you will find that the sun shines clearly over the path where her busy feet have trodden, and that she treads the earth today in a manner which gives full proof to the sincerity of the prayer she offered, and if it be thy will, my feet to walk for Jesus. 
End of chapter 27. End of Spun from Fact by Pansy. Recorded by Trisha G. Thanks for listening.